Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the eighth Circa Online Learning and Virtual Engagement webinar, or SOL for short. This SOL webinar series is Circa's immediate response to the emerging impacts of, of COVID-19 global pandemic on food security by maximizing the use of information and communication technology platforms to educate, to share, and inform evidence-based solutions and tested technologies, as well as best practices on the ground. My name is Kim Bandayan, and I am a program specialist of the Training for Development Unit of the Education and Collective Learning Department. The short video shown earlier has given you a glimpse about CIRCA and what we do. But if I may add, CIRCA is hosted by the Philippine government on the campus of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. So we are coming to you live from Los Baños, Laguna, the special science and nature city of the Philippines. CIRCA's past SOLVE webinars dealt with addressing food and nutrition and security in the time of COVID-19 pandemic through home and containerized gardening, school plus home gardens, sustainable agricultural intensification and open systems, agricultural mechanization. Over the next two weeks, our online conversation will focus on solving emerging diseases through the One Health EcoHealth approach. In 2018, Circa spearheaded a workshop on the applications of One Health towards sustainable livestock production in Southeast Asia, held at Circa's headquarters in Los Baños, Laguna. As part of Circa's efforts to promote a holistic and interdisciplinary approach towards balancing productivity and sustainable development in the expanding livestock industry in Southeast Asia. In the same year, the World Health Organization came out with a handbook titled Managing Epidemics, where it mentioned, and I quote, given the effects of globalization, the intense mobility of human populations and the relentless urbanization, it is likely that the next emerging virus will spread fast and far. It is impossible to predict the nature of this virus or the source or where it will start spreading. A year after the World Health Organization published the manual on managing pandemics, the world saw the emergence of COVID-19, which has unleashed not only a global health emergency, but has disrupted the global economy. Our speakers today will discuss the One Health, EcoHealth approach that recognizes the integral connections or link among humans, animals, and the environment in relation to people's health and well being, and promotes interdisciplinary collaborations to better understand and more effectively respond to threats to health security. But before we proceed, please allow me to quickly go over some very interesting statistics gathered from the SOL webinar held last week, June 10, 2020. The infograph shows that 72% of our online viewers last week were female and the rest were male. This data has been consistent with the figures gathered over the past seven SOL webinars that we've had, whereby women dominated our online attendees. The infograph also indicates that more than 100 individuals tuned in via Zoom, while more than 400 viewed the webinar through Circus Facebook page. And lastly, we are happy to note that we've had online attendees as far as Afghanistan, Canada, Nepal, Burkina Faso, of course, the Philippines, Bhutan, Indo India, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, and the USA. This shows the number of individuals and countries that Circus webinar has reached so far. We are trying our best to be able to reach as many individuals, farmers, farming communities, and countries as possible through this online platform and really make a difference in the lives of our stakeholders, especially in this COVID-19 era. Now, going back to today's webinar, you will see today's lineup of speakers on your screen. After my introduction and a few housekeeping rules, Dr. Serge Morand will talk about One Health, Planetary Health. 
Dr. Panomsak Promburom follows with his presentation on the integrated system and participatory approach to enhance One Health Eco Health issue management. We will have our first round of Q&A after Dr. Panomsak's presentation. After the Q&A, we will proceed with Dr. Flavi Gotard's pre-recorded presentation on the research platform of the Greece Network and how it promotes collective action for better health in Southeast Asia. And for our last speaker, we will have Dr. Vicente Belisario Jr., who will discuss the topic on understanding COVID-19 experience in the Philippines using One Health Lens. We will have our last round of Q&A at the end of Dr. Belisario's presentation. For those of you who are joining for the first time, our speakers will begin shortly with their presentations that you will see on your screen. During the presentations, we invite all of you to send in your questions via the comments section if you are watching through Circa's Facebook page. If you are registered and tune in via Zoom, please post your questions or comments in the Q&A section that you see at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on the gadget you are using. We will collate the questions and once we are in the Q&A session, our speakers will address them in the time remaining. May we request you to kindly indicate your location and our country of origin, it would be good for us to know where you are watching this webinar. We encourage you to please like Circus FB now by pressing the little thumb, thumbs up sign just below the cover photo for us to remain socially connected. By liking our FB page, you will regularly receive updates on our learning events, webinars, and postings on recent developments on agricultural and rural development. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be made, will be made available on Circa's FB page and YouTube channel. We are happy to inform you that you can now access the recording of the first three sold webinars and you may also subscribe to Circa's YouTube channel. Today's presentations will be made available on Circa's website at www.circa.org and you may check them out in a day or two if you want to take another look at our speaker's presentations. The slides shown during the first seven webinars have already been posted on our website. If you have issues or are experiencing technical difficulties with the Zoom online platform, please email my colleagues at solve at circa.org. I repeat, please email my colleagues at solve at circa.org if you are encountering any technical difficulty. Let us now move on to our first speaker this morning, Dr. Serge Morand. Dr. Morand is the CNRS CIRAD Research Director and Research Professor of the Faculty of Tropical Medicine, Mahidol University, Thailand. He has a background in evolutionary ecology of disease transmission. He has a, uh, his research focuses on health ecology, including climate, and last news change on the links between biodiversity, health, and societies in Southeast Asia using wildlife-borne diseases as model. Dr. Moran, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, the, for your invitation uh, for CIRCA. So it's a very great pleasure to, to, to be here today. And I will start by sharing my screen and I will put one else. So I think we have 15 minutes. So my pleasure today to, to introduce some um, comments <clears throat> on the One Health Planetary Health, uh, especially of course, as uh, it was uh, already mentioned uh, in the time of these uh, pandemics of uh, COVID-19 uh, coming from a virus from the wildlife and after that spread in several months only to all over the world. And actually, the WHO has mentioned uh, with their, uh, their manual, what they published uh, last year was really right. We are living in a great acceleration of emerging infectious disease, but a great acceleration of quite every socioeconomic earth systems factors 
<clears throat> we are living in a new <clears throat> geological era, which is the Anthropocene. And uh, Anthropocene is uh, characterized by this huge increase in water use, primary er energy use, urban populations, but also all the surface temperature, the climate change, the domesticated land, a lot, everything is increasing. At the same time, we can see the increase of the human infectious disease. This is the data that I collected from uh, the Gideon uh, website, showing we are more and more outbreaks of human dis infectious disease, still the 1940. Actually, it's also the same for the animal infectious disease when we use uh, the data uh, coming from the OIE. These are completely related with the sharp, incredible increase in uh, traffic, air traffic of passengers, air freight passengers, almost 1,300% increase from 1970 to 2016. So it's a real huge, and these are completely related. Not only the disease for uh, humans and for animals, but it's also the disease for the plants. We are also facing a huge increase <coughs> in terms of the epidemics of fungal disease that affect plants, animals, but also the, the wildlife. Sharp increase also related to the globalization. And this is really also related to the absolutely incredible increase in terms of the livestock. If you're looking at the number of the head of the cattle, we have less than 1 billion in 1960. Now we are close to 1.5, more than 1.5 billion uh, of cattle, if we include also the dairy cows. Actually, in the world, if we wait the total amount of the, of the animals and the human, the weight of cattle are far more important than the weight of humans. And after we have just the pigs, the sheep, this is only that's related to the wildlife. And after all, chickens, dogs. So really we have a, a planet that are dominated by the livestock. And this may explain why we have also this kind of uh, huge impact on biodiversity. Yes, we know that biodiversity is also linked with a higher number of infectious and parasitic disease in the country because viruses, microbes are part of the biodiversity. So the more you have the wildlife in this country, the more you have potentially infectious disease. But actually, when we look at the biodiversity at treat, and especially the number of mammals and bird species that are treated in the country, we see that a hotspot is Southeast Asia, actually. And this, this incre increase of the treats of wildlife is completely related also with the increase of the outbreaks of infectious disease. Actually, there is something that are really going in this way. We are living now more and more in unstable societies mostly because of this increase of farming on livestock, which affect a lot also the, 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 the impacts on deforestation, habitat loss, biodiversity. Also because the urbanization, so more and more people need the food, the agriculture products produced in the farm. With the global travel, all these affect the climate change. All of this will have affect also the increasing contacts between humans, livestock, wildlife, increasing zoonoses, and after you have increasing like the pandemic. So we need to go a little bit more in terms of what to go now. And yes, the future is now. We have to manage and we have to develop science for achieving sustainable development as it was already one of the mandate of the SICMO. One of these, of course, is the One Health approach. The One Health approach is quite interesting because it recognizes the connection between humans, animals, and environment, and to better promote 
and uh, coordinate uh, management of the risk. And actually, we are really in this term of the global change. But when we look at this, actually look at the, the COVID now, we have a really good take of the human health, of course, because it's the human health. Animal health starting to understand and to be in the process of to be really considered. This is the human on interconnection with animal health. Actually, I have to say that we need more environment into the One Health approach, a greater intro, intro integration of environmental domain in the One Health. Why? Because when we look, for example, at some uh, website, like uh, the World, World Bank uh, website that are really promoting the One Health along to many other uh, international organizations, yes, they recognize that uh, human health are completely related to animal health and you have to have more collaboration. And they also recognize the importance of the environment health, environmental health and the management of systems of the environment. But most of the time, the one else are too closely related to only to prevent um, disease treats. And uh, to mostly to promote multi-sectorial uh, activities, but mostly for surveillance, for laboratories, for risk assessment, communication, policy development activities, and they are, the environment is still back. We need to have more environment into the One Health. I'm oh, sorry. That's why there is something else we can uh, really think about it is the new uh, uh, framework that have been promoted by the Rockefeller Foundation Commission with the, with the Lancet. And this one was uh, promoted as the planetary health. What is the planet, planetary health? Actually, it's recognized the importance that we are living in the Anthropocene. It's recognized that we are living in the great acceleration of all uh, big, factors and these big factors could be the biodiversity, the land system change, the climate change, the ozone, the atmospheric, the biological, uh, biogeochemical flows, ocean acidification, water, fresh water use. And this, it is, they are the planetary boundaries. And the vision is that if we are going too close to these planetary boundaries, like for example, for biodiversity loss, we can affect so much the planet that can affect also all civilization and uh, human health at least. And these are the key factors, the key environment, mostly climate change, biodiversity loss. And these have a direct health effect and we know now for the floods, for floods, for climate, uh, for extreme events in terms of climate. But we know that we have to better work into the ecosystem management and the use of ecosystems are to mediate uh, health effect. That is also really promoted by the WHO. Finally, we should think like this from the great acceleration to planetary boundaries, to national policy targets. If we think that we have some planetary boundaries, they are at a global scales, really global scales. So it means that uh, each country, but of course, contributes differently to these uh, planetary boundaries and to go close to the planetary health. So we need to develop, uh, and now this is the, 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 the people are starting to work on this. We need to have more environmental data on modeling. This we need to have more the socioeconomic dimension. And these are more also at the level, local level to national level. What are the footprints of our activities and especially the farming activities what we could interesting for us, but also of course there is relation between the globalization and 
the importance of the ethical dimension on the equity principles. Nations are not equal in terms of their impact on the planetary boundaries, but we are all equal in terms of the, what we will suffer from when we starting to mismanage the ecosystem services or the planet. I think the pandemic of COVID-19 really show that, uh, that all countries in the world now will suffer a lot from uh, the economic impact of the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, emergence and, uh, and uh, the global, uh, these global pandemics. This from the planetary boundaries should go better illustrate and better impact the national policy target. This is also a, a time really to better work on the, 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 the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals are now to more integrate the problem between agriculture, biodiversity and health. And this, this is also something that are really important with all of us. We need more stakeholder dialogue. And I think Dr. Panonsak will really uh, put us to think a little bit more about this, how to integrate modeling assessment. So my final word will be like this. We are living in a great acceleration. Livestock, trade, biodiversity loss, infectious disease. One else, we need really to go to the one else in practice. So I mean the one else plus really the environment, the biodiversity, the climate, the land use science. And we have to think that this, we have to think that globally on the planetary health and the planetary boundaries, it's you just to finally to think about the definition of new commons or new public commons. And finally, is for us as a scholars, one message from the planetary health. And I will finish with this quotation. The present systems of governance and organization of human knowledge are inadequate to address the threat to planetary health. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Moran, for that very interesting presentation and for putting into context the link between human health, animal health, and environmental management, and also introducing a new concept, the planetary health, based on the understanding that human health also depends on natural systems and wise, and wise stewardship of those natural systems. Um, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Panumsak Promburong. Uh, he is a research scientist and lecturer at the Center for Agricultural Resource Systems Research, Faculty of Agriculture, Chiang Mai University, Thailand. Dr. Panumsak, may we have your presentation, please? Thank you. Yes, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Siaga, for the invitations, allowing me to share you, with you all my experience on bringing you know, the approach into practice to deal with the uh, One Health and Eco Health issue. So I hope you all can see my uh, presentation screen. So I jump directly to the, the contents of my presentation. Set. Given a uh, complex One Health and Eco Health related issue problem, so my task as uh, Dr. Rico uh, suggested to me that how to deal with this complex issue. So given such a, a issue, so I I will share with you uh, these uh, contents. The first is about how to contextualize. The, this complex issue. And based on that, how this could help us or guide us to design the proper research and intervention uh, project to achieve uh, our common desirable outcomes or change. 
So I bring you back to this complexity. So I would say that uh, such an issue that we are interested in right now is emerged from the interaction between you know, the e ecosystem and social system. From these interactions, so it makes the issue of problem emerge. So you can see from these pictures, there are many components there are two main subsystems. There is an interaction between these two subsystems that make the issue emerge. So since this is very complex, it's keep you know, evolving all the time. So it calls for you know, the uh, interdisciplinary effort among the research scientists, among the disciplines, as well as you know, those actors who are playing important roles in this arena. So the challenge of bringing this interdisciplinary into transdisciplinary, it's about how to, you know, step out from our convenience zone or comfort zone, we call it silo, into, you know, interdisciplinary and also includes those actors and key actors in, in our pathway. And along the pathway, we have to face with one of the challenge about, you know, conflicting interests. How are we going to compromise that? How are we going to co-design our intervention actions as well as the monitoring and evaluations? So these are the challenges that we have been facing in the past. So in the past, we can see that when we look at the same picture, we focus in the same issue, but in our mind, we tend to have the different point of view toward that issue. These are the example of actors or people who are playing the roles in this arena. So this would lead to the different you know, direction of further actions to deal with that issue. So among um, my network of COMOT or company modeling network, so we try to find a way to reconcile this different representation toward this complex system or complex issue. Try to co-construct a common representation or better understanding toward this complex issue. And we do hope that along this process, we would come up with the change or outcome, for example, the perceptions awareness and also the behavioral change. So I will summarize at first what I, I, I'm going to present to you in the, the process of uh, participatory modeling to deal, deal with this issue. So we, the firstly, all of us would get stuck on this complex issue. What, what it is, why it's become like this. And we try to work together to co-develop the rich picture since we have well enough understanding toward this issue, so then we can think further about what would, would be our desirable vision or desirable change that we would like to make things happen. So in general, there, there would be you know, diverse you know, ways or visions to achieve our goals. So we can do the scenario tries on our proposition intervention. And since we are sure enough, so let's make change happen. So the next question set is about what kind of intervention, who will do that, how to do that. You know? Inevitably, we have to deal with the several stakeholders, several actors, and what kind of strategies for achieving those change. So that's what I'm calling the cross-sectoral collaboration platform that are needed for One Health and Eco Health Management. So the collaborative process start with co-identify the issue, try to better understand the context of the issue. And then we could identify the gap, what's wrong in there. And then we co-design the future visions, what we would love to see uh, to happen. And then we co-design the intervention plan, who will do that, when, how, where. And at the end, or along the pathway, we, we will do co-implementation and also the co 
M and E. So system contextualization is about uh, using the system thinking to explore the issue of interest. So in one system, as all of you may know, there is a certain boundary, the number of components that you know, structure together, and there is an association or interaction between them. So this is a <clears throat> basic idea of system contextualization. Among the common network, so one of the tools that we use to explore this complex system is party, problem actors, resource dynamic and interactions. So the uh, step of the party is to identify the issue first. This is important and specify the specific purpose of doing this. Why we want to understand better this complex system and how could we represent it or elaborate it by identifying the boundary, what, who are the key actors, what are they doing, what kind of interaction or they can act upon those, you know, the natural resource or ecological elements. So to identify the, the actors in your system, this is, a very, this is a simple way to identify the actors who contribute to the issue. For example, ministry doing the role in prevention and control, but they are not affected by the issue. And farmers, they, they do not contribute to the issue, but they are affected by the issue. This is one, the simple uh, stakeholder analysis, or, or you can go to very <clears throat> sophisticated stakeholder analysis, look at the, the interest of each stakeholder, the power and influences, influences toward the, the issue. So I won't get into the detail. So since we can identify the actor, so we put together the, the actors and other systems components. What are they doing? How are they interacting? This is a simple diagram. So in fact, in the reality, this is the, uh, the example case from Vietnam. I organized a three-day training workshop in Vietnam. It's about the avian influenza issues. So the 20 participants from medical doctor and also the, the, the veterinarians worked together, did brainstorming. And finally, uh, after the two day heavy discussions and fighting a bit, so they came up with this uh, simple system uh, contextualizations. The key actors are in the uh, square box and the lines uh, represent the action and interaction among them. For example, who? This is the one organization that play playing a role in avian influenza prevention and control. And this one shared information with this uh, department. And if we dig deeper into the, the process of actions, for example, share info. Share info. The step of sharing info, the verify the info that they receive from, from the staff at the remote village. And then they report to the, the hate and then they wait for the replies. And then they got, if they get the reply that, hey, keep quiet, don't you know, share to the public. So then the, the information is freeze there. So no info convey or share to the public. So that's why the, the avian influenza uh, problem is still there. So this is the example of how we use the system contextualization to better understand and, and to pinpoint the gap for intervention actions. Of course, since we are not satisfied with the current system, so either we could make adjustment or modification of the system by adjusting the component properties or adding the new component into the system or modify the act, action or interactions, or add new action or interaction into the system. That's what are we going to propose to solve or to improve the situations. 
in some cases, we may need the sophisticated, you know, the dynamic uh, simulation and modeling and simulation to explore our scenario. What if we modify our, our system in such a way, you know? <clears throat> and this is an example of the situation that we are not satisfied with. At, under current situations, I will zoom in. So these are the uh, undesirable situation that we would like to make change under our project time frame. Okay, we have to be able to identify this gap. So the challenge is, in most of the cases, based on my experience, most of the challenges is about making change happen in those key actors and stakeholders. Thus. So we have to dig deeper into their mind, what is really their needs and interests. For example, what are the farmer needs? The better, better health and livelihood. And for the school, better education, adequate support. And for those uh, departments, you know, they would like to improve animal health, good support and get promotions for example. So we have to understand better, you know, the, each key stakeholders. Otherwise, they will constrain our intervention actions. And we have to identify the change to be made for each stakeholder or actors, and then try to find which method that we are going to apply to a, a, achieve those desirable change or proposed change. So it's mean that in the, uh, the project design, we have to be clear, very clear in mind, you know, which kind of actor that we are, we are going to work with or interact with them, in which way and what kind of change we would like to occur or happen to them. All right. So I apply the uh, outcome pathway and theory of change to help the, the project design, you know, what kind of change or precondition we would like to occur and what kind of intervention action that we have to conduct to achieve each step on the pathway. So precondition is desirable change. And also during the implementation, we can put the M and E along the pathway. So we have to identify the indicators, identify the interventions, and so on. So in summarize, we use the system approach and participatory approach and tools to better understand the complex issue. Since we could identify the key actors, and then we identify what kind of change we would like to happen, and how to achieve those changes. So this is, uh, you have to be practical about uh, designing and implementing your project, targeting very precise actors and identify the, clear, the, the method and action to be applied. So it's about the cross-sectoral and transdisciplinary platform that we are needed to achieve this. So in summary, the process Outcome and remark it's about we start with the seeking the common issue of interest, co construct a better understanding, identify key actor and expected change. And along this uh, learning by doing, we can see we can appreciate the value of the, of the disciplines and how to bring the added value, value of the interdisciplinary effort. And this approach could move you know interdisciplinary toward transdisciplinary work together between the scientists sector and stakeholders of course we have to face the challenge on how to balance these diverse disciplines and value but the important outcome along this uh, participatory process is about core learning capacity building partnership and networking and strategic stakeholder analysis and management is needed in order to co-design co-intervention. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Dr. Panum Sak, for sharing with us uh, the process of participatory modeling in dealing with real life issues and problems uh, to achieve desirable outcomes or changes that you want to see. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Panum Sak uh, had to leave the webinar room for a very important appointment. Hence, well, we will have our first round of Q&A to give Dr. Panum Sak an opportunity to answer at most uh, two questions from our online attendees before he leaves. So um, the first question, Dr. Panom Sak is from uh, one of our uh, Zoom viewers. Uh, the question is, in the companion modeling process, you taught us about future vision as basis for the identification and designing of the intervention. However, it is also inevitable that members of a community may have variation in its idea. How do we resolve this? So I, I may not uh, mention clearly in my presentation, but actually in practice, we involve not only the, the research scientists, but also those stakeholders who are affected by, by, by the issue. So we, we engage them in, in the process in the intervention process. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so to, to bring the awareness, because of course it's, it's very difficult to make the people change, but yes. along this uh, participatory or, or involvement process, so it's gradually adjust their you know, perceptions and awareness and finally in the action. Okay. In a follow-up question, uh, Dr. Panom Sak, in implementing companion modeling or commod approach, how long does it take to implement this? Is it expensive? It varies from case to case. And I would say that more than 300 cases that apply the commod and to uh, deal with the, the diverse issues each of them is very unique in terms of the uh, implementation period and as well as a time and cost expenses. Yes, of course, it's very intensive, you know, the process and in involvement, but as I mentioned earlier, making change inside of people, I think is, a, is the most uh, challenge for me. So it's, it's worth to, uh, to, to spend time and yes. or even budget, but I would say that at the end, more or less, something will sustain after we terminate our project. Okay, it may be expensive, but it, it's worth it. It's worth it. Yes. Um, are you still, do you still have time to answer one more question? Yes, yes. Okay. For students in other Southeast Asian countries who might be interested to implement Komod and, world, and would like to study in Chiang Mai University, are there any opportunities that they can explore? Uh, there are two opportunities at the moment. In, at my center, we are running a graduate program on you know, agricultural resource management and Come up is is one is part of the subject that I'm teaching, oh, yes. and in the past there have been numbers of uh, students from our Asian countries that got support from Siaga Siaga to oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to study in our center. And another challenge is, of course, uh, we do, we do have the collaboration with Greece, Dr. Flavi, who is going to to present to you, you know, our collaborative effort in these regions. Yes. So we have been organizing number of training regarding the, the combat approach and you know, bringing this approach into practice and then several times. And I have been in Philippines one time in 2015. Okay. Just one week training is very tight training. You can ask Dr. Rico. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there are opportunities available for those students who would want to uh, study about companion modeling. Yes, either okay. degree training or short course training. Okay, then. It'll okay, so that's all that um, 
That's all the questions that Dr. Panam Sak can entertain right now. We have to let him go. He might be late for his next uh, important appointment. Thank you, Dr. Panam Sak. Or you can for, get uh, the uh, question with the Dr. Rico, and then he can forward to me by email. So I'll yeah, he will. He will respond to those uh, questions. Yes, thank Thanks you so much. Thanks again for your uh, attentions and for the circa invitations. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning, Dr. Panam Sak. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on to our, goodbye, Dr. Panam Sak. Moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Flavi, Flavi Guttard. Please note that Dr. Flavi's presentation has been pre-recorded due to time difference between our two countries. It's, it is 4 a.m. Uh, in France, where she is currently based. But before we have uh, her presentation, let me, please allow me to introduce Dr. Flavi. He is, she is a veterinarian specializing in applied epidemiology. Currently, Dr. Guttard is an adjunct professor at the veterinary faculty of Kasetsart University in Bangkok, Thailand. She is the coordinator of a One Health International Master's program called InterRisk, which is implemented by Kasetsart University and Toulouse University in France to train health risk managers. He is also the coordinator of the Greece Network, which is a research platform for emerging infectious diseases in Southeast Asia. She contributed to the development of One Health curriculum in accordance with the French regulations on training, including analytical epidemiology, with a number of students in Southeast Asia and France. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Flavi Guttard. Good morning. My name is Flavi Guttard. I'm a researcher for, working for CIRAC, who is a French research organization working in development. I'm a veterinarian and epidemiologist. I'm actually based in Bangkok, where I'm coordinating a research platform named Greece. This morning, I will talk about um, research in action. Um, I will develop some uh, projects activities, strategies that we have developed in the region in order to promote collective action for better health. First, what is Greece? Greece is a research platform that has been developed um, with different partners in Southeast Asia in order to respond to one else challenges. So we have uh, worked together on the, some interdisciplinary framework for better understanding of one health and health complex issue. We work to strengthen the interaction and dialogue between disciplines, sectors, and key actors. We uh, try to improve risk management strategies through projects or activities. And uh, we try to uh, develop some tailor-made recommendations from scientists to policymakers. Greece is composed of seven core members, CIRAC, and six research institutions or universities that are based in Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Philippines. Associated to the seven core members, we have 18 regional and international partners, going from Institut Pasteur of Cambodia or Oxford University in Vietnam, but as well the School of Environmental Science and Management of the University of Philippines in Los Banos. And we have collaborative centers like OIE, FAO, but as well ILRI, or the Global Health Asia Institute, or as well in Philippines, the um, Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture. So our main objective within Greece is to combine a corpus of method to discipline in order to develop strategy to answer question uh, targeting environment, biodiversity, animal disease, public health, or policy from local level, so like local perception of farmers, to global drivers. So we work in integrated manners, following 
one else and records an approach. In fact, if we look back at the definition of one else, uh, so we uh, target collaborative effort of community health science provision uh, with the related discipline and institution to obtain optimal health for people, domestic animals, wildlife, plants, and our environment. But the idea inside Greece is as well to uh, try as much as possible to be transdisciplinary and to recognize the complex biophysical, social, cultural, political, and economic relationships between the ecosystem and the human health. For us, EcoHealth provides a strong basis to address the interplay between health hazard and other social or environmental determinants. So within Greece and uh, within the different projects or strategy, strategies that are developed by our uh, partners, we are trying to focus more on healthy socio ecosystem and not on specific disease or pathogen. We try as much as possible to have horizontal integration between disciplines and sectors, to have vertical integration between different scales or administrative levels, to promote uh, a shared representation of the system and so to push people toward a common objective and to uh, enable co-construction or co-evaluation. So for that, uh, when we develop projects or activities, we use different methods from quantitative methods like uh, what is used in epidemiology or bioscience, but as well some methods used in qualitative uh, science like um, social science, economy, uh, anthropology, uh, participatory. So one of the solutions that uh, we have developed together within Greece uh, to be uh, more efficient, to achieve more outcome or impact, it's to merge together social and biomedical science. So I will give you some examples of innovative tools or methods that uh, were uh, used uh, under some project. I will uh, describe some of the methods and I will link this method to some publication uh, where then you can find more details. As I told you, a lot of, of our methods are using um, participation, like participatory epidemiology, um, because in fact participation is really enabling uh, people to find solutions to their own development challenge. And um, being in a participatory approach, it's both an attitude and a philosophy that encourage learning, discovery, and flexibility. So in a lot of the methods or the tools that I'm going to describe, we use participatory epidemiology. So uh, in fact, it's based um, on the use of participatory techniques to gather epidemiological intelligence from community. To be able to develop tailor-made solutions that are adapted to the community and to the problem or issue, um, there is um, a lot of research that are needed uh, to understand better the perception of the people involved. So it can be farmers, but it can be as well uh, other stakeholders uh, like veterinarian or decision makers. One of the methods that uh, we applied uh, several years ago are the Q methodology. So the Q methodology is a semi-qualitative method that studies the subjectivity of individuals regarding a complex and sensitive subject. So the main objective when you use this method is to identify a group of individuals showing the same point of view and to determine commune and distinguished opinion on the same subject. And from these different groups, you can tailor your communication strategies or um, the interventions that you want to implement in these different groups. So uh, we work on the different fields uh, using this method in uh, Thailand and Madagascar for the usage 
of uh, antibiotics and their alternatives, as well on uh, the perception of farmers uh, about the vaccination of foot and mouth disease in Vietnam. Perception is one factor, but uh, to change people's behavior, you need as well to understand the practice and um, the gap between uh, the knowledge of people and what they really do. So we work on that in Laos, in Cambodia, for example, uh, working uh, again on the usage of antibiotics. And uh, we used CAP survey, so knowledge, attitude and practice survey, uh, which help us to identify the source of misconceptions or misunderstandings that may represent the potential barriers to a behavior change. So we had several interviews of different types of farmers, drug sellers, veterinarians in Laos and in Cambodia. We used as well um, another tool to understand practices. Uh, so we use stakeholder mapping analysis, again, uh, on the usage of antibiotics, so on the value chain of uh, veterinary drugs in Laos and in Cambodia. So this method is a, is a process of systematically gathering and analyzing qualitative information to determine whose interest should be taken into account when developing and or implementing a policy or a program. And this method helps us to describe the role and interaction of the different stakeholders involved in a drug supplier chain. So it's understanding practice, but it's going beyond practice. It's as well uh, trying to identify uh, when you have a policy or when you want to change something, what are going to be the uh, leverage to change this policy, but as well, what's going to be the barriers. So here in this map, you can uh, see uh, the different connection between the stakeholders involved in the drug supplier chain of, uh, of Laos. And uh, with this type of map, you can uh, look at uh, the different type of information and connection between the stakeholders, but as well uh, try to identify uh, what are the weak points or weak stakeholders uh, where you will need to have um, strategies communication or intervention to make them adopt a new regulation or a new policy. Another approach that uh, we have developed to um, achieve some impact and to promote uh, change, it's uh, using simulation and especially role-playing games. It was uh, tested in Cambodia to look at the risk of uh, Nipah viruses uh, from bats. Uh, so we work with different villages in different locations, trying to understand their interaction with bats. And uh, a role-playing game was developed to uh, try um, to see how people actively could keep their village in, uh, in good health, uh, depending on the season, depending on their practice, and um, to identify which people uh, need to change and how they could change. This type of uh, simulation game was then uh, taken on other level with the development of, uh, of a real game uh, in, uh, in collaboration with uh, a private uh, partner, uh, BioViva in France, um, to develop, uh, it was a use for rabies prevention. And uh, the idea was to help people to um, acquire new knowledge through the game, to uh, initiate some change in the players, um, to increase their motivation, to be able as well for the different people as players to apprehend the diversity of the different stakeholders and what are their uh, field of action and to understand better the complexity of rabies transmission. 
So this tool is really a good way to facilitate integrative approach. And it was um, first used for rabies, but now it's uh, developing, uh, it developed, sorry, uh, as well for tick prevention in Europe. In the last section of my talk, I will uh, talk more about one thing, which is surveillance, and uh, more uh, specifically on joint or one health surveillance. This type of surveillance uh, raised a lot of uh, questions and challenge for the uh, past few years, uh, as it's not so easy to think about uh, a good design and to think about how to evaluate this type of surveillance and to assess uh, what is uh, one else within the surveillance system, what is integration, and how much integration is enough to have something efficient. So if we look at the different uh, objective of surveillance uh, linked to uh, the different compartments, where you will uh, implement your surveillance, you will see that you may have different tools, different methods. And um, one method that has been developed lately is uh, participatory um, surveillance in order to um, better involve the community in the um, strategy, in the design of surveillance, and as well on accepting better the outcome of the surveillance. So what is participatory surveillance? It's the application of participatory rural appraisal methods into the collection of epidemiological information to inform decision-making and action. It has been applied in Africa and in Asia as part of emergency program to address H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza pandemic, but as well uh, for foot and mouth disease, for example, under the Greece network uh, in Cambodia and in Vietnam. And this type of surveillance uh, enabled better acceptability within the surveillance system. So that's it, some methods to design the surveillance. But one um, important question is how to evaluate surveillance and how to evaluate one health surveillance. So um, what uh, is critical for some of the surveillance system and especially uh, surveillance system that are based on free declaration from farmers of veterinarians is the acceptability. Acceptability uh, is the willingness of person or organization to participate in the surveillance system and to the degree to which each of these users is involved in the surveillance. And in fact, using participatory approach, we have developed uh, a framework to evaluate the acceptability of different stakeholders um, actively involved in the surveillance system. Um, so we uh, use this framework to assess acceptability for African swine fever surveillance in Corsica and uh, bovine tuberculosis in Belgium. By side working uh, on design or um, evaluation of surveillance system, we worked a lot on promoting better uh, one health surveillance system using the example of antimicrobial resistance surveillance in Vietnam. In fact, in Vietnam, uh, there is a development of a new uh, national action plan. And this, this plan, uh, the country uh, would like to develop a one health surveillance system, integrated surveillance system. And so we worked uh, on different tools and methods in order to uh, provide recommendation to achieve this objective and to provide a more efficient one health surveillance system. So the first step was to uh, use stakeholder mapping analysis to identify levels and barriers to collaboration and formulation of recommendation to help the operationalization of the multi-sectoral surveillance system. So we 
try to map all the different actors involved in this uh, surveillance, the link between the stakeholders and the influence of this of each of these stakeholders in the elaboration of a new surveillance, one health surveillance system. After um, having identified the different stakeholders and the barriers or the levers between them, we use participatory modeling to define concerted collaboration modality for a new one health surveillance system. So this type of method enable um, a good environment for the stakeholders to share their vision, constraint, and expectation. And this model supports the co-construction of a shared representation of a desirable surveillance system. So we uh, used three steps. We uh, put the stakeholders together, asking them collectively to design uh, the current surveillance system. Then to collectively design a revised surveillance system based on the desirable and feasible change. And then to ask them to identify action to move towards a revised surveillance system. And then last uh, tools that we developed to help in a more efficient uh, one health surveillance system uh, was to, again, to look at the evaluation, but not to look at um, the different attributes that are already well known inside surveillance, like uh, uh, sensitivity, specificity, uh, or timeliness. Uh, but we uh, look specifically at one uh, attribute, which is collaboration. And the idea was to uh, evaluate the quality and the appropriateness of multi-sectoral collaboration through an in-depth analysis of its organization, implementation, and function. And to do that, we have um, came, we came out with a grid uh, based on different questionnaire interview uh, in order to grade uh, and to score different uh, level of collab collaboration. And um, if this collaboration is enough to reach the objective of surveillance. And all these different methods combined help us uh, to uh, provide recommendations in order to uh, uh, implement in Vietnam uh, a better one health surveillance system, more efficient. So to finish with my presentation, uh, I just uh, would like to uh, emphasize that what I presented today is a small uh, sample of all the action, project, tools, methods that have been developed uh, from the past few years within Greece. And so it's not reflecting uh, the overall uh, activities that uh, all my other colleagues are involved to. Uh, but it gives you uh, some idea on uh, how um, working together, trying to integrate qualitative and quantitative approach could help to design better uh, solutions uh, and to uh, improve the animal and the public health and the environmental health in the region. So um, I would like to uh, thank you again to allow me to do this presentation. Sorry to not be able to be present. Uh, I'm sure that um, Circa will uh, give me uh, the list of questions if you have any, and uh, I will be uh, delighted to answer any question. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Flabi, for your presentation about Greece Network and how the network responds to One Health challenges through the development of multidisciplinary approach in your research and training projects and strengthening synergies among research institutions. Dr. Flabi uh, also presented to us a number of uh, research methodologies and participatory tools in to gather epidemiological info that will inform decision making or policy making. Um, so um, we
We move on to our last, but certainly not the least, a speaker in today's online conversation. Uh, let me introduce him to you. Uh, Dr. Belisario Jr. is currently professor and dean of the College of Public Health of the University of the Philippines, Manila. And also, he is also the director of the Simeo TropMed Regional Center for Public Health and adjunct professor of global health in the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He holds the rank of University Scientist Three of the UP system and has done research on control of tropical parasitic infections with research outputs published in over 90 peer-reviewed scientific publications, a number of which have provided basis for formulation of global and national policy and practice guidelines. A doctor of medicine with postgraduate training, training in tropical medicine and public health, he was a former vice chancellor for research and executive director of UP National Institutes of Health. After a short stint at the World Health Organization Regional Office for the Western Pacific as technical officer for neglected tropical diseases or NTDs, he served as undersecretary for technical services of the Department of Health of the Philippines. Dr. Belisario, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Kit, and a pleasant uh, morning to all. Um, special greetings to uh, Director Glenn, Dr. Glenn. Thanks for the invitation, Dr. Rico. Uh, fellow panelists and attendees no, in this uh, webinar series of Sharka. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, share with you uh, two major things updates on COVID-19 experience in the Philippines and how we may be able to use the One Health Lens you know, to tackle, face COVID-19 along with other zoonotic diseases. The UP College of Public Health, you know, based in uh, the heart of the UP system, this is the old UP University of the Philippines you know, in, in Ermita, Manila, is also the regional center for public health hospital administration, environmental and occupational health of the CMEO TROPED network. No? So we are uh, alongside Sharka and CMEO Enitec as the three CMEO centers no, in, in the Philippines. The first part of my uh, sharing with you this morning is on <coughs> COVID-19 no, in the Philippines no, from the point of view of public health. We have been very pleased and, and, and privileged that uh, at the start of the pandemic experience in the Philippines, we were tapped by the World Health Organization, Western Pacific Regional Office, uh, to assist the Department of Health Epidemiology Bureau to help track COVID-19 and to actually help collect, collate, process, and analyze data you know, along the lines of data analytics you know, as, as a means of providing guidance to policymakers, among them the IAPF no, no, in the Philippines. Of course, the Philippines is one of the highly challenged countries no, uh, by COVID. Uh, we know for a fact that the Philippines has the longest running lockdown no, no, in, among all the countries in the world. And, and, and I will touch on that um, in a while. Um, uh, just a quick sharing of where we are in terms of COVID-19. The situation amid the data-related challenges, hence the importance of science and the use of technology in this pandemic. Uh, we are more than 20,000 confirmed cases as of the end of last week. Uh, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have weekly um, summaries uh, coming from our uh, uh, center team uh, based in WHO uh, in, during this pandemic. Um, we have uh, a few to hundreds of cases per, per day, but note our cases are split into what the Department of Health calls quote-unquote fresh cases, vis-a-vis -vis cases that have undergone backlogs no, in terms of testing and processing of tests and reporting. A lot of the numbers that we're he hearing on a daily basis are actually delayed figures, delayed to the tune of maybe one to two weeks, uh, at times up to three weeks. 
we've experienced uh, more than a thousand deaths. You no, know, we actually originally had a quite quite a high case fatality rate at six to seven percent, which is quite high. The world uh, figure is something like one to two percent no, case fatality rate. We're going down slowly to about a four percent fatality rate. No? And of course, recovery is being reported on a daily basis. Overall, we are experiencing major delays in testing and transmission of results. Uh, we know for a fact that the Philippines only had one reference lab uh, performing the RT-PCR, which is the recommended diagnostics by the experts, uh, one at the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. Now, we're pleased now that we have grown to a figure more than 50. As of yesterday, we have 57 testing centers. But there's a lot in terms of these testing centers learning how to do it you know, quickly but correctly. Um, we also suffer from a lack of enhanced contact tracing, where contact tracing means if, a, if there is a confirmed case, then we do have to trace all the possible contacts of that confirmed case and possibly test them as well, if not isolate and quarantine them for the next 14 days. There is a misnomer in contact tracing in that the general public feels that it is the Department of Health's job to do enhanced contact tracing, when in fact the frontliners are, are, are actually the local government units, you know, the provinces, the cities, and in fact the municipalities. And you can imagine you know, thousands and thousands of local government units running local health facilities, frontlining contact tracing, no, it's not an easy thing to do, and hence, and, and hence therefore, um, there is a varying capacity, varying ways of doing enhanced contact tracing, and so the, the end product is really a lack of data. And, and, and notice, no, scientists no, in the group, no, we know for a fact that the data no, is, is an excellent basis for policy response and action. Uh, the delays in response uh, come to the tune of maybe one to two weeks, no? up to as, as, as long as three weeks. The data that we hear, for instance, on TV in the afternoon, every 4 p.m. in the afternoon, no, it's likely about one to two weeks late. No? And therefore, uh, there was reporting in the media and, and in fact, even by some, some scientists saying, oh, we have flattened the curve. And then after one week or two weeks after, we see increasing, <laughs> increasing number of cases again. No? And, and in fact, the increases are actually happening one to two weeks ago. The variability in capacity to respond no, to COVID-19 in, ter in terms of testing, treating, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine is, is, is one of the major results of a decentralized health system. No? Uh, similar to agriculture, which is decentralized. No? Unlike the school sector, which is still centralized in the Philippines, Health is decentralized. So you can imagine different ways of doing things as far as local governments are concerned. And, and so we hear in the news, we hear reports of local governments generally doing okay, but this is only in a minority of cases. But most of local governments in the Philippines are highly challenged you know, at the start of the pandemic up to this very time. The pandemic response in the Philippines is guided by the Interagency Task Force um, note that the co-chairs of the task force you know, is, of course, the Secretary of Health, but the more dominant figure there is a general you know, who is appointed by the president. Now, of course, the IATF is assisted by technical experts, including representation from the academy, including the University of the Philippines. The IATF exists at national and local levels, and the decisions uh, use the pandemic interval framework for physical distancing and lockdowns, and the four point strategies prevent, detect, isolate, and treat. And again, uh, IETF providing uh, directions and guidance to thousands of local government units nationwide uh, in a decentralized system with varying capacities across different local governments to gather and analyze epidemiologic data as basis for response. And therefore, the response has been in most instances delayed no? And in most instances, incomplete. And, and, and a major reason for this really is a lack of data and a lack of data. No? Just a glimpse on the epidemic curve. Now, this is the national capital region, which used to be just the epicenter, just the sole epicenter 
of COVID-19 at the start of the pandemic experience in this country, notice that there are actual onset dates and there are proxy onset dates no, marked by the orange vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the light blue uh, bars. Um, the proxy because in many, many instances, and I call your attention to the second line on this, on this figure, there, there, are, there, there is a considerable number of missing information in case record forms that are encoded to populate, to actually feed on to the COVID dashboard you know, as shared by the Department of Health. So you can imagine that the lack of onset you know, uh, actually leads to um, a lack of understanding now of where the epicenters are emerging. Okay, so, so in other words, is so crucial that the lack of completeness of the case record forms in terms of onset does not lead us to where the cases are and where the epicenters are actually developing. So in, in Metro Manila or the National Capital Region, I call your attention to the lower part of the screen, we're, it, we're, we're, it, what, we're somewhat improving in terms of minimizing, re reducing the delays uh, of, of processing and release of results. And, and, and in terms of reducing the delays in terms of res uh, releasing of results to reporting. But again, um, these figures need to re be reduced further you know, because we wish to be able to present data closest to real time to afford us you know, the, 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 the opportunity to act and respond appropriately where the action is part of Sherka. The Sherka is part, part it is in Calabar Zone in Los Baños. Calabar Zone has a slightly less sophisticated looking uh, uh, figure, but, but again, you do have again proxy and actual onset days with, with still missing information in the case record forms. Again, who is filling out the forms, they are the frontliners and they are staff of the local government units no? in a decentralized health system. The health status by age group shows us that in the national capital region, for instance, you have a predominance of the yellow bars that actually correspond to mostly mild cases. Note, however, that even if a patient is marked as mild at the time that the patient consults a hospital and is confirmed COVID positive, that patient does not remain mild. That mild form of COVID-19 can actually recover but on the other hand, that mild form or mild um, severity, mild uh, severity of COVID-19 can progress to become moderate, to severe, to critical. And in fact, there have been many, many instances where mild cases uh, coming in early progress to become moderate, severe, and critical, and ultimately die. No. The, the, the tracking of how these mild cases actually become no, is not seen. No, in, the, in, in the dashboard of the Department of Health. And therefore, there is so much that we don't, we don't know. While we, while we wish to be able to rejoice that, oh, it's more than 80% mild cases, no? this is not a static uh, status of, of being mild the case of COVID-19. This mildness can become, can become moderate and severe and critical and can actually uh, result in mortality rate later on. And again, this is a case of a challenge related to data updating. Calabar zone on the second uh, part of the uh, second quadrant of this uh, slide tell us a similar picture of most of this is not static. The mild can become recovered. On the other hand, the mild can become moderate to severe. And so such no, is a glimpse of the data challenges no, related to COVID-19 as it affects now the response and action on whoever is supposed to act on COVID-19. The second part talks about the use now of One Health. And of course, we like One Health because it's collaborative, it's multi-sectoral, it's transdisciplinary, you know, various levels, local, regional, national, and global. And, 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 and of course, in health outcomes. Uh, and of course, uh, a nice look into uh, hopefully healthy people, hopefully healthy environments, and hopefully healthy animals, which, which is actually the vision and framework for One Health. One Health, incidentally, is one of the three high-priority thematic areas in research and training 
here in Simeo Tropmed Philippines. And, and really, really, uh, I'm very serious, uh, Director Glenn, uh, Dr. Rico, in, hope, uh, in, 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 in aiming to sit down with you one of these days because I wish that our two centers, uh, Tropmed Philippines no, and Public Health, connecting now with Sharka along the lines of One Health, no, which I hope will happen very, very soon. Agriculture and COVID-19, no, there have been no significant disruptions in the supply of food experienced so far, but the logistical challenges we actually experienced early in the lockdown within supply chains led to disruptions no, and, 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 and thank goodness that they actually did not remain for a long term. Reduction in the labor force and restriction of movement cause, cause food loss and waste affecting income and livelihood of farmers and small-scale uh, producers. Um, and therefore, an importance of keeping domestic food supply chains alive and functioning. Thus, there is a need to closely monitor food prices and markets and transparent dissemination of information to strengthen government's capacity to ensure effective management of the food market. Of course, I heard this at the start of uh, the presentation. Mam Kit talked about um, uh, uh, something related to promotion of uh, urban agriculture through distribution of vegetable seeds and planting materials, which supports actually our response to COVID. In the area of food safety, still on one health, to date there is no evidence to support the transmission of COVID-19 associated with food. Food industry personnel, however, will not have the opportunity for work from home arrangements as most of us would, would, would have no, and requires them to continue to work in their usual workplace. Proper hygiene, however, with food, uh, food preparation, proper food preparation and processing of standards, along with social distancing in order to prevent spread of disease among food service staff and contamination of surfaces and food products must be promoted aggressively. Food safety management systems in food industries to manage food safety risks, risks and prevent con food contamination will need to be considered in time of COVID-19. And lastly, in the area of zoonotic and other diseases and COVID, in the face of, the, of, of, of a COVID-19 pandemic, as we are still currently experiencing, there is a need to ensure that other diseases are not neglected. No? Um, uh, our colleagues in the Department of Health are, are, are highly uh, concerned you know, that, that we have, in fact, major public health programs disrupted. Our vaccine-preventable pro vaccine programs you know, are, are, are highly challenged in that before the lockdown, before the pandemic, we were experiencing you know, uh, measles and polio outbreaks you know, and, and thus disruption of of vaccination services no, is, is, a, is a major challenge, along with disruption of service delivery for the other major health programs. We're, we're expecting an increased mortality rate of other diseases in this time of COVID-19. The Philippines, Southeast Asia, is, uh, this, our, our countries are no exception in the area of non-communicable diseases, which actually strikes us hard you know, in the area of causes of morbidity as well as high cost of mortality, high cost of mortality. Uh, the One Health approach teaches us the, the coordinate, coordinating, coordinating approach you know, in targeting zoonotic diseases, including COVID-19. And we wish to be able to ensure the continuity of select essential services that can be delivered safely at the community level. So in summary, COVID-19 experience, response in the Philippines, collaboration is key towards enhancing surveillance and response capacity along the lines of what we actually promote in the area of One Health. While we have experienced some successes where Department of Health has collaborated with other government agencies, the World Health Organization, the academic, professional societies, and private sector, enhancing surveillance and response capacity, there is still a need for increased collaboration among sectors in, in a more coordinating way. A few challenges you know, actually experienced will be the immense need for capacity building in surveillance and response, especially in the decentralized health setting like the Philippines. Collaboration, therefore, even in the area of capacity building, is very much needed. The concern on major public health programs remains, 
interruption or disruption resulting in the delay in meeting of our sustainable development goal targets by 2030. And, 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 and thus, learning again from One Health, we do need to consider three Cs, collaboration, coordination, and enhanced capacity building for COVID-19, zoonotic diseases, surveillance and response and control more than ever. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Belisario, for enlightening us on the real COVID-19 situation in the Philippines amid data-related challenges, uh, which affects, you know, you, what, which affects decision-making and timely response to this pandemic. It's good to know that One Health is one of the three priority thematic areas in uh, research uh, training in Simio TropMed. Um, uh, please know that One Health, EcoHealth is also one of the strategic trusts of Circa in our 11 five-year plan, which will start in July, 2020. So, or will be launched in July, 2020. So we now move on to our um, last round of Q and A. Um, may I remind our online attendees uh, watching the webinar, webinar via Facebook Live, please start typing your questions now in the comment section, including your location or country of origin. If you are tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions in the Q&A box. Okay, so uh, let us begin. The, the first question is directed to Dr. Serge Morand. Okay, you discussed, this is from one of our Zoom uh, viewers, you discussed about the need to, con to convert goals, re goals related to planetary boundaries to national policies. In Southeast Asia, can you share where are we in accomplishing these tasks? Thank you very much. This is a quite important question and I'm not sure that I'm the best to, to reply to this question. And actually, what is um, that's why I like to, to work in Southeast Asia, uh, mostly to learn from Southeast Asia, because I, actually I'm a member of several activities uh, in the Ministry of uh, uh, Ecology in France. And usually I use what I learn in Southeast Asia to, uh, to inform my government to maybe we can improve the, the way we manage the relationship between biodiversity, agriculture, and health, which are not so good uh, in France, actually, or even in Europe. What is interesting in Southeast Asia, you have the ASEAN. And the ASEAN communities, which is not that the European communities, which is better because it's a, it's a, it's a platform, it's an, the place, is a forum that are the members, the, the states, the nation of uh, Southeast Asia, can discuss, can exchange ideas. And I participate in several ones, and especially the one related to the One Health and the One Health and Biodiversity. And I was very impressed by the way the sharing of knowledge, the sharing of ideas, the sharing of realization. For example, Philippines is the lead in terms of biodiversity and uh, with the ASEAN uh, Biodiversity Center uh, with as Los Baños. And is very active in a way to gather and to uh, information and to, uh, to interact with other countries. And I remember that uh, during the, the, the uh, conference between the WHO and the, and the CBD on biodiversity and health. Now, what is going on? Several important things are going on. The COVID-19 will affect a lot uh, the, the agenda of the international organization. Everything has been postponed. The, the next uh, conference of parties of uh, biodiversity, which would have been in September in, uh, in, uh, in Kunming in China, will be next year. It's the time to prepare ourselves to, to, to help our government, administration, whatever and they are, to share the information and to go to this. This is uh, quite important. And the same for all of the organization. 
So it's time maybe more to develop ideas in terms of uh, practices, in terms of uh, knowledge gaps, in terms of education at this time, and to contact the people from uh, Philippines that will go to this international uh, conference of parties. Thank you very much, Dr. Morand. Our next question is directed to Dr. Belisario. Sir June, everybody has been waiting for the development of the vaccine for COVID-19. And in fact, there are claims that things will remain as is unless we have developed one. For a developing country like the Philippines, what should be in place for us to develop vaccine for future pandemics? Thank you, Ma'am Kit. The va vaccine is on trial no, by at least uh, three or four companies no, in a number of countries in the world. Uh, the Philippines is aligning itself also to be a uh, trial site. No? Um, uh, the Department of Health and the Department of Science and Technology are actually uh, facilitating this. And, and, and one of the centers for vaccine trials will be the uh, University of the Philippines, uh, Philippine General Hospital. Uh, mm. Vaccination, uh, ideally, is one that will confer some, some considerable amount or levels of immunity among our people. Uh, but think of the scenario that when, when the vaccine trials do end no, with phase three, no, they're, they're, they're on phase three now. And in fact, mm. the United States is a little more optimistic than others. No, their president says that their vaccine will be readily available before the end of the year. Uh, some American experts say possibly the earliest would be next year. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it will be uh, some time before the vaccine actually is made available to the general public in the Philippines. Uh, you can imagine if the phase three trials indicate uh, levels of safety and efficacy that are highly acceptable, there's going to be a huge demand you know, for these vaccines worldwide. And uh, if the Philippines can pay the price you know, for the vaccines, and of course, when the vaccines are newly introduced, the price is still consider high. considerably high. You know? Unlike vaccines that have been around for quite some time with so many manufacturers. And so, so such will be the challenge of uh, the use of vaccines for COVID control and prevention. And as such, uh, uh, it looks like um, looking at the vaccine reaching the Philippines for, for the use of the general public this year is a little too ambitious. I would, I would predict, you know, my forecast is the earliest it could happen is possibly next year, possibly middle of late next year, if the Philippines can pay, all right? And, and, and we'll have resources for that. There will need to be prioritization also of who among our people will receive the vaccine first. Of course, the high risk, the exposed, we we'll need to receive that first the non-immunes. No? And of course, there will be second and third priority and so on and so forth. So in the meantime, when the vaccine is not around, no? we, we still go back to basic public health. And we've been hearing them over and over again. You know, the social distancing, the basic hygiene, um, uh, the face mask. No? And of course, uh, things like testing, treating, isolation, quarantine, contact tracing, and data, data, data will need to be in place. So if there is a lack of social distancing or lack of use of face masks or la lack of hygiene, a lack of testing and contact tracing, and, and you can imagine a, a, a non-concerted effort you know, to actually control and prevent COVID-19. Thus, we need a concerted effort, right? collaboration, coordination, you know? and, 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 and a huge need for information dissemination, you know? strategic communications, not just our policymakers, you know? even our service providers. We don't want our service providers proliferating the not so true news, you know? meaning the fake news. And of course, the public also believing the news that is based on data going back to the basics also on evidence and data as a basis for policy and action. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Belisario. It seems that we still have to wait a long time for the vaccine to be developed. Uh, it needs a lot of money <laughs> and it will cost really high uh, when, when it's, it starts to be uh, introduced here in the Philippines. 
Um, another question is directed to Dr. Pranum Sak. I, I think Dr. Pranum Sak is back from his uh, appointment. Yes, uh, welcome back, Dr. Pranum Sak. Dr. Pranum Sak, um, there's a question here from Ms. Genevieve Dabon Arnado Ledama. Uh, because we talked about uh, commod modeling earlier and there are opportunities for students who would want to go into uh, companion modeling. And the question here is what are the requirements and what should be the bachelor's degree of, of the student who would want to go into companion modeling? It's uh, very open to almost all of the disciplines. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm from the science base, as well as the uh, economic and social science are welcome. Okay, so anybody can take the course. Uh, yes. Yeah, from any uh, fields of uh, discipline, discipline. Yes. Okay, um, back to Dr. Morand. Dr. Morand, the question is from Jeanette Estigoy Razo. Upon weighing the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, are we to say that this is a precursor of the planetary health emergency? For me, for, for, for several scientists, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's real this. Um, actually, there is uh, two things that was going on and it's really related to some kinds of globalization. First, and is for most epidemics uh, related to emergence related to the wildlife. There is something going on at the local level. What happened that makes some new contact between wildlife or between the, 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 the domestic, the livestock animals, starting a chain of transmission, a local chain of transmission, but after to go to the, to the hub and finally to be spread all over the world by the global system of transportation of uh, people, but also of goods. So yes, there is something really related to the planetary health and the planetary boundaries. We have to think a little bit more and more about the effect of globalization on transportation, climate change, but also on the maybe rethinking of uh, relocalization of the food system. Thank you, Dr. Morand. Um, the next question is for Dr. Panong Sak from uh, Ms. Violeta Villegas. Dr. Panong Sak, the question is, Thailand managed COVID-19 better than most countries. Where the principles discussed, where the principles that you discussed applied in managing the pandemic, Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yes, uh, Thailand managed COVID-19 pandemic better than most countries. Were the principles that you discussed applied in managing the pandemic? Uh, I think... On participatory think modeling, the, yeah. No, I think the, the government, yeah. they put all the, uh, the lead to the Ministry of uh, Public Health which is their expertise on this issue. So that's, that's I think that's one uh, very uh, crucial decision-making of our government. And then the, yes, the prime minister and the government follow the, the suggestion from the, the, the cohort team, that most oh. of them are uh, medical doctors. And the second uh, factor is the, uh, I think there's the, the communications within our society. Mm -hmm. So this uh, working group, they communicate and disseminate the, the important information is very precise, very frequent. Mm -hmm. And I think, yes, one of the things is a fear. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when, when, when we have the fear in mind, we tend to avoid, so we, we follow this, this, the just suggestion from the government, and then that's keep us, you know, in a better situation, very quick. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Pranumsa. Uh, back to Dr. Belisario. 
How from Wilbert Bebit? How can they say that the numbers of COVID-19 positive? Uh, how can they say that the numbers of COVID positive flattened the curve despite the rising despite rise of its rising number? What is the basis? Okay, the, the flattening of the curve is based on data that are seen in the Department of Health dashboard. No? It, it's available online. You can actually access it. But you need to uh, consider the context of the delays. No? The delays in testing. The testing itself is not as simple as it, as it sounds no? because as we speak, there are testing centers that are overwhelmed with possibly even hundreds of specimens that are awaiting processing and examination. No, so when you see the spikes, no, when you see a flattening, it may mean that there is a lack of tests being uh, performed and, and, and results of which are not being reported. No? When you see sudden spikes, no, there's an inflow of more results no, getting into the database no, so that it appears as if uh, the spike is happening now. I, I go back to what I said, and, and, and the message really was there is a delay of one to two weeks. No, currently, it used to be something like two to three weeks as a whole. So what we're seeing, what we're hearing today is probably late by about one to two weeks. Oh. Okay, so therefore, um, uh, very difficult to conclude no, where, where we are now because of a lack of, and I always say this, no, I'm kid, no data, and a lack of data, 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 data. No? With incomplete data, it's very hard to situate ourselves. How are we faring vis-a-vis uh, -vis COVID? No? And are we really flattening? It, it, we, can, we will know if we're really flattening if enough tests are being done no? to the tune of the target 30,000 tests per day. We have not even reached that target yet. No? Mm -hmm. um, I was in a webinar yesterday with our colleagues from public health schools in the Asia-Pacific region. I was hearing about Malaysia, much smaller than us, much less people. They are, they are actually performing 35,000 tests per day. And here we are with 105, close to 110 million people, and we're doing much less than 30,000 tests per day. No, so we're not doing enough testing. And so our, our data remains... Uh, lacking. So. Okay, uh, there's a follow-up question to that. Uh, is the Philippines really flattening the curve? I am very much confused with the parameters the DOH are currently using as basis for claiming that we have made it. So we have not made it yet. We have not reached that uh, stage it, yet. It appears no, there's enough base, there, there, is, there, there is not enough basis to say we have flattened the curve, number one. Number two, uh, looking at the curve, no, as seen in the DOH, Department of Health dashboards, give, gives us one source of information as basis for response and action. I wish to call the attention of the listeners, no, the viewers, that you can also make use of other parameters. Take a look at the hospital occupancy. If hospital occupancy increases, no, and, in, and as we speak, as we speak, the Philippine General Hospital has increasing number of admissions. No, and, in, and in fact, it's almost reaching its full capacity. You know, that They will need to open a new ward you know, for COVID-19 referrals. Um, um, our colleagues from the Lung Center, from the Heart Center, are, and there are contemporaries you know, from the University of the Philippines, they're talking about increasing number of cases you know, and, not, and not diminishing number of deaths. And therefore, that's another uh, basis for, for response and action. No? Um, uh, looking at the curve is one, but with incomplete data, let's take a look at, at additional sources of information. No? Among them, the, the hospital occupancy and, and the number of deaths and the number of recoveries. But, but, but we're not quite there yet. No? We're still working on it. We have to help each other. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Belisario. There's another question here. To what extent do science-based data and evidences are being used by the interagency task force in coming up with their recommendations? I, I think uh, I, I, will, I, I, will, I will say that yes, they're basing uh, their, their decisions and, and, and policy formulation on data. But again, I, I, I bring back the concern on the completeness 
no, of data that that possibly does not paint the full picture of what's going on. No. So incomplete. No, you're, you're not seeing the whole landscape. No. Um, where COVID is, no, it, it's, it's happening in, in, in smaller communities now. Yes. And in fact, we, we have shifted to, in, the, in Metro Manila, we've shifted to urban poor, where mm. people are crowded, no, where yes. people are living neck to neck with each other, no, uh, inhaling each other's breath. No. And in such cases, there is a, there's a huge need for community isolation units away from their households, away from the community where, where quarantine and isolation is we, we are seeing um, small foci of of of, of hotspots no, in at the village level no, based on the data that we are seeing coming from the dashboard okay we go back to uh thank you so much dr belisario for that uh information um we go back to dr serge moran in light of covid19 pandemic and its impact to all of us do you see a likely increase of similar pandemics in the future? How can One Health Eco Health approach be effectively used to ensure resilience against these diseases from one of our Zoom online viewers? Thank you. It's again a very difficult question. <laughs> but first, I would like uh, to, to thank uh, Dr. Panonsak and Dr. Vicente for their, uh, their reply of the question. It was very, very interesting to see. Uh, how the, the different countries can manage on the difficulties or the, to manage this kind of uh, new uh, pandemics. The same, uh, we have the same problem uh, in France. And uh, actually, the, the, it was already said by the WHO um, last year and by some other organizations and by many scientists that uh, we have to prepare for a new uh, pandemic. And actually, the pandemics arrive uh, this year. So, yes, there is two solutions, two ways. Either we continue to, to prepare ourselves. We have to do this, actually. Uh, prepare ourselves, which is uh, very costly. Huh? We we'll see how much it takes to, to prepare the, the public health, the animal health sectors on uh, everything on on actually the, the big the huge impact of uh, any this kind of epidemics on the social economic and uh, even for the the, the well-being of everybody so or we have to use the eco health one health planetary health approach thinking that uh, okay we have to avoid how to avoid how to better manage our relation between uh, ecosystem, between nature, how to reinvent agriculture and farming in order to reduce the risk of emergence. And in this case, to better, um, to have more or less impact of uh, a potential new epidemics. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Serge. Um, we have one more uh, room for uh, one last question um, to Dr. Belisario. As a former undersecretary, how do we translate science into policy actions given the social political conditions? Very important question. Of course, uh, these are uh, extremely challenging times. No, I, I say just not. I say not just challenging, challenging times because uh, we're we're pushed to our extreme because of the social political climate. No, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and as we move on to the new normal, no? we know for a fact that science and technology has a major role to play in in in, in the health sector. No? Public health is a science-based discipline. No. And so is agriculture. No. And, and, and thus, um, um, I wish to see the Department of Health, no, having been there my, in, inside, the, inside that agency myself, and I love Department of Health. No. We're, we're, uh, BOH is supposed to be an agency that we must all help. Because if Department of Health fails, everybody else fails. The Department of Health is the leader of the health sector of this country. No. And, and thus, uh, we wish to be able to push even even harder 
the use of science and technology no, for uh, for better health no, for the Filipinos. No? And and we will continue working on that. Our Similar to the Philippines, a regional center of public health was actually uh, uh, initiated, was actually established initially no, in our first uh, so many years, our first few decades, mm -hmm. not to help the Department of Health. And, and we honor that, that, that mandate, no, now a bigger mandate to help Southeast Asia, but first and foremost, this country, we wish to be able to be OH, so pushing science and technology for better health for the Filipinos. No, but let's all work on that. No, let's help each other. It is not a job for semi-tropic Philippines alone or for just uh, an institution or a group alone. No, this is a concerted effort from amongst us, the different sectors, helping Department of Health, because helping the Department of Health is really helping the Filipino people. I think I'd, I'd like to end there. And I wish to invite uh, uh, one and all to help in, 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 in small or, or even bigger ways, the health sector to push forward you know, for better control, prevention of COVID-19 and other zoonotic diseases. Very well said, Dr. Belisario. So I guess that's all uh, the questions that we could entertain at this time. Um, rest assured that for those of you who sent in your questions, uh, we will be sending them to all our speakers and uh, hopefully they will be able to address them as soon as possible. But before we end this seminar, may I request all our speakers for some parting words, uh, takeaway message. Maybe start with Dr. Serge Moran. Uh, my takeaway. Just a brief one. <laughs> yeah, a brief one. I think uh, education is the first important thing. So we need to have new students that can work at the interface between public health, animal health, and the environment. Thank you, Dr. Serge Morad. Dr. Panomsak, maybe hear from you. Uh, likewise, what uh, Dr. Sash said, that's very important. We are lacking of the people who are capable to you know, incorporate all of the science and other sectors. So I think that's one of the key that we need in the, in the near future. Thank you, Dr. Panomsak. And yes, Dr. Belisario. Thank you very much for this uh, very good opportunity to, to interact with all of you. I end with five Cs. Five Cs that stand for let us collaborate. And once we start collaborating, we will coordinate our efforts. That's the second C, coordinate. Now, who does what? What are our deliverables? We contribute to a bigger whole. The third C is to come up with a consensus. We have the information, the evidence, the data. Can we come up with a consensus? What's happening to the Philippines, Southeast Asia now in terms of COVID-19 or other zoonotic diseases? A consensus guided by evidence, no? the role of science and technology. Number four, fourth C is communications. Now we need to be able to communicate the evidence palatable to policymakers, no? enhancing the capacity of our service providers and increasing, enhancing the knowledge for appropriate behavior of our people. No? And lastly, an immense need for capacity building and we hope to be able to do this with Sharka in the near future, similar to the Philippines and Sharka, a joint capacity building, gathering of evidence for One Health and not just COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all our speakers. Um, once again, with Circa Director Dr. Glenn B. Gregorio, B. Gregorio, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to all our speakers, um, Dr. Belisario, Dr. Serge Moran, Dr. Panumsak, and Dr. Flavi Gotard. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. So can we create a pandemic-free world? There is no such <laughs> thing as a guarantee but our speakers today have shown us the importance of taking a collaborative, transdisciplinary One Health approach to prevent future COVID-19 outbreaks. Our speakers also highlighted that there is an urgent need for increased collaboration, as well as an integrated and multidisciplinary approach to finding solutions that would, uh, that would uh, reduce the impact of this global pandemic protect the most vulnerable and strengthen the country's 
overall resilience. Remember the five C's of Dr. Belisario. We have collaboration, coordination, communication, uh, coming up with a consensus, and capacity building. So before we close, please let us know what you think about this webinar by clicking the link to a quick feedback form, which will take you just a minute to accomplish in the Circa FB page. If you registered via Zoom, you will be redirected to the feedback form before you leave the webinar room. Your feedback help us improve the webinar and make each one better and better. For those who wish to receive an e-certificate for participating in today's webinar, please visit the link shown on your screen. Please note that we will only accommodate requests for e-certificates within 24 hours after the end of this webinar session. I repeat, we will only accommodate requests for e-certificates within 24 hours after the end of this webinar session. We would like to inform everyone that we issue more than a thousand e-certificates after each webinar. And so please wait for your e-certificate to be issued within 10 working days. Thank you for your understanding and, and patience. Please join us again for the continuation of this One Health EcoHealth online conversation next week to further understand EcoHealth One Health approach and how it can be used to guide policy and research interventions. We will know about SESH, which means Socio Ecological Health System, and a specific case studies in Africa, France, and of course, Southeast Asia. So please visit our Circus uh, FB page for details on how to pre-register for this webinar. Let us help one another get through this COVID-19 pandemic. We hope that as we go along, we will be able to create and build a community of better, bigger, and smarter farmers and farming families. This is Kim Bantayan of Circa. Stay healthy, stay safe, and hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much.